gener for generating all of this interest. And so um, I think we will begin. Um, so I think I will begin by uh, inviting Karenza. So Karenza, welcome back. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Karenza joined, I think, just about... It was more than a year ago and it was warm. Was it something like September 2022? <laughs> Yeah. Um, we had the after party special where there's also uh, Julia Zampini and Lisa Williams talking about after parties. And of course, at the after parties, there was some uh, ketamine, uh, there was some ketamine yeah. discussion. Um, but so, uh, Karenza, many, many thanks and welcome back. So <laughs> if you could I mean, obviously tell us a bit about who you are, what you do <laughs> and some of the research you've done um, concerning ket ketamine use. I, I will do. Thanks, James. OK, so... Um... I think some people will know me, but uh, my name is Dr. Karenza Moore. I'm redoing sociology at Newcastle uh, University. I've uh, been researching uh, recreational drug use for about 20 years or so. Um, so uh, just after the pandemic, uh, set up a project uh, called Safer Partying. And uh, part of that was to interview uh, kind of people in drug services. Um, and one of the issues that came out was about young people's uh, ketamine use. Uh, I've been thinking about that in relation to the kind of nearly 20 years anniversary of uh, ketamine use being uh, ketamine being brought under the misuse of drugs act as a class c uh, drug in 2005-6 um and so there's a kind of long-term uh, interest in ketamine uh, there um and also hooked up with uh, kira watson uh, who used to work at crew and now works for a uh, scottish ambulance service so i should say a, a, a thanks to kira for uh, the, the work that we've been doing on the project as well um, and it, it kind of came out of noticing pre-pandemic from about 2018 a kind of rise in visible ketamine use particularly in uh, dance music scenes and techno scene uh, that I'm involved in um, and then speaking to Kira she'd said she'd also noticed this and then kind of post-pandemic obviously we're kind of looking at uh, the figures and seeing a rise in ketamine use uh, in the general population surveys and uh, I've got various different figures here for you about that um, but we sort of started to say we need to uh, kind of look at what young people are doing around ketamine uh, and also I suppose to say that there's always always been concern about young people's ketamine use in dance music scenes um, so in 2008 uh, Professor Fiona Mish and I uh, published uh, a paper called uh, The Most Fun You Can Have for £20 uh, about ketamine um, and uh, you know we kind of wanted to do a, uh, I wanted to do a reprise uh, of that and think about where we are now uh, with ketamine so um, the study uh, was a combination of participant observations so Kira obviously spends time going around um, welfare tents and festivals um, and then uh, I looked at 30 nearly 30 uh, hard techno events uh, across the UK over the last two years um, and what was one of the reasons for that um, was that when in previous research we'd found that in harder dance music genres there tended to be higher uh, drug use more generally but a higher ketamine uh, use in particular. Um, so, uh, so that was the kind of background I guess to uh, the study so we did uh, participant observations some single and paired interviews, uh, which are still uh, going on at the moment, and then the targeted population survey for uh, lifetime ketamine users over the age of uh, 16. So I can talk a little bit about uh, some of the some of the findings uh, on that, I suppose. Um, so just to kind of give you a very brief uh, summary, um, sort of key findings from all aspects of the uh, project. Um, really just asking about you know why ketamine why ketamine now um i mean 75 percent of the survey respondents said that they thought ketamine was viewed as acceptable uh in dance music scenes um there was a, a lot of people talking about how much more popular it had got within across dance music scenes but particularly in the harder uh, genres uh for the reasons for that people were talking about how cheap it is which i think we'll talk about quite a bit today uh, also about dose dependency, so uh, they people felt like they could manage uh, the dose that they were having to get the effect that they wanted. So, for example, in hard techno scenes, it's all about kind of tiny little bumps uh, to give you energy. Uh, so that was something that came out. Uh, a lot of people talked about how they do 
more ketamine at after parties than they would at the main event, but that they had started doing more at the main event as well as after parties, uh, if that makes sense. Um, there was a lot of kind of perceptions of ketamine uh, as fun, uh, safer than MDMA, which I thought was interesting. Uh, good because of the lower intoxication time and uh, lower recovery time as well, as opposed to, say, MDMA. Um, seen as quite cool, uh, kind of definitely cooler than alcohol, um, but there is quite a lot of stigma in some uh, dance music scenes about its use. Uh, so, I mean, I'm, we're suggesting that it's kind of differentially uh, normalised. Um, polysubstance repertoires. Uh, so there's a word I've not heard before, cocaine, spelt with a K, uh, which is the mix of uh, cocaine and ketamine, which seems very popular. In terms of why people are using it, uh, I think Rebecca Askew uh, talked about functional fun. So, for example, uh, dance into hard techno is really physically demanding. So people would talk about how it kind of uh, helped them have consistent energy. Uh, but also uh, ketamine use as not just fun. So in the survey in particular, because we have a lot of written answers, uh, people are talking about um, that they would use or they have been using ketamine to explore some of their own problems with their kind of found family or their friends. Um, friendships are also, and this was a theme 20 years ago as well, about how uh, uh, ketamine is used in the context of friendships. Um, and then I guess what we'll also talk about today in terms of health. So 96% uh, of the UK uh, survey respondents said that they uh, thought ketamine can cause issues for some people and 30% said that the ketamine was an issue in their social group uh, as well which I thought was very interesting and then quite a lot of written concerns about uh, you know various different effects mental and physical and uh, relatively good awareness about uh, bladder issues uh, as well so I suppose uh, the context is a concern I have about a policy ratchet um, obviously Ketamine was changed from class C to a class B drug in 2014. Um, and I mean, if you look at the kind of 20 years in terms of prevalence, we've just seen a steady rise since we started gathering data uh, about it when it was criminalised. Um, uh, and again, post uh, pandemic, there seems to be uh, again a rise and a kind of uh, a more diffuse use amongst a wider uh, group of young people. Um, and again, this is from Kira, the kind of need for lots of conversations with her, uh, with young people. Um, so these kind of findings are hoping to uh, inform some of the materials that we're going to develop uh, for use at festivals. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's me. Thank you very, very much yeah. for that, Karen. And yeah, really, really interesting findings. And especially since I am further away from the uh, dance music scene than I would like <laughs> to be, the um, <clears throat> increase has somewhat, I guess, uh, caught, caught me by surprise. Mm. Um, and say, so, yeah, very interested to hear that, very interested to hear much more about the current social context of it, uh, which I, mean, I guess I'm not as uh, socially close to as I used to be. So now, uh, Val, if you could come and uh, introduce yourself. So many thanks. This is the first time we've met in any in-person or online feature. So very, very nice to meet you. And thank you very much for um, coming along. So again, uh, following the theme, if you could let us know um, what uh, I guess your main research activities, research insights are. Um, I believe you've done some research into some of the long-term impacts of ketamine, but I'm um, pleased you have to introduce yourself and your primary ketamine insights now, please, uh, Val. <laughs> okay, thank you, James. Um, well, I'm a professor of psychopharmacology and uh, a clinical psychologist as well um, at UCL. Um, and I'm interested in both, I know we're not talking about therapy here, but I'm interested in both the therapeutic uses of ketamine as well as recreational use. And it's just kind of interesting to me now, just looking back, that ketamine became a medicine back in 1964. So people on, on the chat have been talking about, you know, ketamine isn't just used by young people, but as a medicine, ketamine is going to be 60 next year. You know, it's one of the safest drugs in the world it's got a huge importance in low and middle income countries where you can't really have op operations often um, with any other anesthetic so it's been really important it was important in the Vietnam War um, it's a very very safe drug used medically and as we now know it's being 
used therapeutically in lots of different ways, but I, sh I shouldn't really go on about that now. Um, and in, in higher income countries, it's now used as a an, as an antidepressant for treatment resistant depression. So I think all that side of it is very interesting as well. But for our own research, and it's, it's all been done with a team, um, uh, usually with lots of young drug researchers and PhDs and uh, postdocs, um, that, uh, yeah, we started in 1999 when the wonderful Celia Morgan was an undergraduate and she wanted to do her third year project with me at UCL. Um, and yeah, we we started working on ketamine then um, because Celia knew a whole group of, uh, of ketamine users who were uh, in all sorts of contexts, sometimes clubs, but more often uh, squat parties and that sort of thing in those days. And uh, we sort of used a lot of the techniques we'd used in researching ecstasy or MDMA um, and went to the environment where people were taking ketamine and assessed them then. We set up laboratories in clubs and parties and uh, we tested people on the day or on the night and then again a few days later when they were sober. Um, and so that way we could tease apart the kinds of effects that ketamine was having on mental health, on um, especially memory. It's a very, very important drug in terms of effects on memory. A lot of its therapeutic properties probably come through that as well. Um, and, you know, we realized was, at that time there wasn't very much done on the effects of ketamine um, in, in, in a scientific way. Um, and so, you know, when we looked at it, we, we asked people what dose they were taking, and it was about double the dose that had been used in any of the American studies that at the time were giving healthy people who had never had any experience of ketamine, um, ketamine in the lab. So the people recreationally taking at least double that 150 milligrams or two milligrams a kilogram at that time, but it's obviously changes over, over time. And then we Shortly after that, uh, Celia and I teamed up with um, Brigitte Brandner, who's an anaesthetist. I should also mention that I saw on the uh, the people who are in the audience that we've got a lead anaesthetist who um, works with animals, Polly Taylor. So hi, Polly, um, who has done some wonderful work as well. Um, and we teamed up with Brigitte Brandner at the University College Hospital and the whole Centre for, for Anesthesia there. So we got to use the same assessments we were using with ketamine users um, in the community within the hospital where we gave ketamine. Um, and my team, who are mainly younger than me, much younger, um, they actually made me uh, be a guinea pig and um, I was given uh, ketamine in the in the hospital. So I, it was really good as an insight to get to know what the effects were. It's actually I remember the date. It was uh, it was on the 22nd of March. It was my uh, my daughter's 16th birthday birthday uh, when I took it, which wasn't very responsible, really, for a parent to take it. But uh, anyway, I still had to run the party afterwards. Um, yeah, so we learned a lot about um, the various effects, especially the memory effects, but also the schizo schizophrenia-like symptomatology that can occur in some people. It's very different, but it's uh, it's been an important model of schizophrenia. Um, and um, yeah, and then we went on to Celia and I, we, we, we got a grant so we could do some more in-depth work and we did some qualitative work with 90 ketamine users, 30 frequent ones, 30 who used it five or more days a week, and then 30 infrequent ones who were using about half of that or less um, to really try and tease apart the huge differences. I mean, anyone who's worked with ketamine users knows the, the huge diversity of experiences they have. And within our own team, we videoed each other um, under the influence and it's extraordinary how some people became catatonic. Um, I became completely delusional and my limbs just stretched miles and bizarre, uh, but very interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, and from there, we really started to, to move into looking at more positive therapeutic 
um, ways that Cashman could affect particularly the recent stuff that Celia has been leading. She, she started off as an undergraduate with me and she's now a professor of psychopharmacology at the University of Exeter. Um, and other people like Ravi Das and Sanji, who I mentioned before, have also um, been showing how this drug could be a therapeutic in alcohol use disorder. But we've done a lot of longitudinal work with ketamine users, trying to tease out what the long-term effects are and looking at it qualitatively to see what kind of um, you know, benefits and, and problems people are having in their day-to-day -day, um, life. And again, you know, you, you get these very different um, different kind of uh, responses. You know, you say, what what is great to you about using ketamine? You know, you get the sort of psychonauts who will say, oh, I love the ego dissolution. My um, consciousness becomes intertwined with divine entities and, um, and all semblance of the physical world disappears. Or again, another kind of quote from that research is the numbness detachment and enhancement of music combined with e it's warm and glowy and then you get other people who will say it's cheap and really gets me off my head so that's the, that's the drug for me um yeah so so we, i think we've, we've traveled a long way and used very different methodologies to try and get at the ketamine experience and at the possible long-term effects, positive and negative. Good, thank you very, very much. Well, actually, before we move on to the discussion, I've actually uh, got points to go back to on Josh and Krenz. After it, very quickly, you mentioned on ketamine being one of the most uh, safe or harmless drugs out there. So I wonder if you could expand slightly. Um, I wonder if you're meaning kind of in, I guess, an acute way that it is difficult to overdose on, or are you talking about the more of the long-term impact. I mean, certainly it was uh, 20 years ago I arrived in Brighton and during my four years, there was lots and lots of ketamine and certainly not all people's bladders uh, lived to tell yeah. the tale after that time. So I wonder if you could say a little bit more from your kind of psychopharmacologist's background of what some of the perhaps are acute or chronic or, or more long-term harms of ketamine that you're aware of might be. Okay. Um, so the long-term harms are, are um, both physical and, and mental. Um, as you've mentioned already, ketamine-induced uh, bladder issues, ketamine cystitis, is, is a, a big problem for, the, for some of the very heavy users. And at the, the extreme, um, they, they've had to have their bladders operated on. And that's that causes all sorts of problems for them the rest of their life, really. Um, when we ask them in our own research, when we're asking them about physical issues, one thing they say even more than ketamine cystitis is um, is a sort of abdominal pain they call K cramps. That I don't know if uh, if Josh and Carenza have come across this as well. That you know we really don't understand um, how these occur but it is something that really bothers a lot of people. And it's especially problematic in people who have developed a dependence on ketamine because often it's the only way of getting rid of the K cramps is to have more ketamine. So, so there are those issues. We also find some of the long-term effects um, on mental health. And again, you know, mental health effects of drugs is, is hugely diverse depending on people, people's pre-existing mental health. Um, but some people, you know, who've become addicted then do give up and find that their mental health does improve. Um, and, you know, some people experiment with ketamine as being a, an antidepressant that they could use themselves without um, a prescription. Hmm. Um, but the, yeah, the, the schizotypal kind of issues do per persist in some people for days after they've they so different people are just very very different their bodies react very differently to the drug i mean it's the scarring as we understand it that reduces the capacity good diet good health breaks seem to really make a massive difference in terms of um you know improving your bladder health but you know why results vary so much across different people 
it's impossible to say. But I would say the cystitis seems to come first. Um, you also talk about mental health. Yeah, regular ketamine use definitely um, leads to depression. It's a bit of a catch-22 because a lot of regular ketamine users are um, mostly without realising self-medicating to an extent for depression. Um, but, you know, it just ends up making it much, much worse than it ever was before. But those symptoms generally do clear up if you stop even just for a week, you know, is generally enough. Um, and yeah, the um, the temporary delusions, that sort of almost like schizophrenic type symptoms are really, really common with like really intense, very, very high doses, kind of delusions, thinking things aren't real. Catastrophizing is really quite common, um, especially with regular users. Um, but that's mostly, in my experience, a case of two hours later, they're back to earth and it's fine. And we see a lot of that in welfare like loads right um but give them two hours and they're fine i've not really known it persist for you know a day or two days it, i think it, it's very much reduced but it, it does persist in, in in heavy users um mm. just to some degree but much less than the, the acute i mean a lot a lot of people like ketamine because unlike other drugs it's only kind of really there for an hour and you can kind mm. of come you're back to normal with concrete boots but uh you're back to normal within that time. Yeah, I think I think um that was one of that was one of the things that that come out of the interviews and the surveys. Um, so quite a lot of uh, interviewees, particularly, said it's useful because they've got say zero hours contract, and they don't know when they're going to be working. Um, so they they kind of like that it doesn't necessarily last that long. Also, getting back from events was something that people mentioned that they would try to kind of. Uh, manage their dose so that they were ready to get in a taxi or get a train or whatever after the event which I thought was quite interesting um so yeah I think the the short acting is one of the the kind of motivations um for it as well which is yeah it's fascinating to hear you speak Val about your research in that era can I say era um because I remember when we I was looking at ketamine and I first come across uh your research and like wow somebody else is looking at ketamine so um i mean i think that the, the 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 where we're at now how much it's changed over the last kind of 20 years it did feel like a little bit more of a niche uh, substance uh, previously um and i think to a certain extent it it it's still is in terms of higher prevalence in certain kind of music scenes um but but the extent to which its use has kind of spread um uh, I know Kira was um, had mentioned about you know older people uh, using ketamine as well, uh, which hasn't necessarily been seen before. Um, so yeah, so I think we're in a really interesting space now um, with with the, with the drug. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Are you seeing the same effects with cannabis about older people, people over sixty now, are sort of taking it up again? Yeah, yeah. I think the, one of the other things just to pick up on something you said about people explore well, so, so a lot of people had mentioned about social anxiety in particular and how they were using ketamine to manage social anxiety in uh, social situations uh, and how that was in part related to coming out of the pandemic and that so we found that quite a lot just after the pandemic um, but more generally um, people talking about exploring um, uh, uh, grief that, that they'd used ketamine to uh, cope with grief that they'd experienced um, uh, and also around PTSD. So uh, people saying I discuss he heavy issues with my chosen family uh, whilst we're on ketamine, which, mm. um, you know, so I think there's some really interesting things going around kind of non-medical settings. It's got mm. the therapeutic use, but in non-medical settings, um, which is... Sorry. I, I would say you're right, but even not necessarily uh, purposefully if that makes sense people aren't purposely sitting down to have a therapy session but that is often what ends up happening yeah and and yeah so this is in relation to clubbers and raves this is this is kind of after parties you know yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. so that is necessarily yeah not a therapy yeah. session in that sense but yeah I think that's, that's right. really interesting um Karenza, because you know, th uh, there's also research now exploring the use of ketamine as a therapeutic aid with psychological input as well 
in PTSD. P sorry, and PTSD has been mentioned quite a bit in the survey as well. Um, yeah, that's no, really been... interesting. Uh, also, just to chip in on um, the point about um, bladder issues and cystitis, there's a there's some Chinese research which has come out um, where they've been looking at potential ways of treating it, which is quite interesting. Um, it's a shame we don't have more of that kind of research in the UK. Um, but I have from that found some ways of kind of helping those issues. Um, so if anyone wants more information on that, um, feel free to drop me a line. Oh, one thing I'd like to go back to you, so I think all of that has been super, super interesting. Um, one thing that I was kind of wondering, um, as we were talking about some of the issues people have, so people have faced them, um, could you kind of tell us about how people present to you at Rave Age Group? We mentioned a little bit about people kind of having these psychotic symptoms which tend to pass after an hour. And I shall briefly mention an anecdote I know of. She's a GP now, but used to work in A&E in Bristol and he had a group of young people coming in um, thinking one of their friends was about to die and their friend thought he was about to die and they really wanted to phone the friend's parents and my friend the doctor says please just give it half an hour an hour you'll be fine you really really don't want to phone his parents now just give it an hour and everything will calm down which it did um, but so apart from you know people experiencing I guess uh, you know a particularly distressing um, ketamine experience how else do people present and how do you tend to help people um, at Rave Aid? Yeah, I think um, it's probably be best if I actually draw on experience from doing welfare at licensed events too, which I've kind of done plenty of, I guess. Um, you know, at licensed events, you do get exactly what you just said. You know, friends coming in, they're really worried about their friend. Are they going to die? Is everything OK? And the answer is yes, give them an hour and they'll be talking to you again, um, generally, yeah um uh yeah and then i guess um at rave aid crew it's kind of more people kind of um they're often more experienced they kind of know what's going on um they're kind of like more acute levels of drug use are much more normalized so there's kind of less of that worry are they going to be okay it's kind of like oh do you mind if we just pop them here and we're going to go dance for a bit i guess um yeah, but, you know, it's, um, you, you have people, you know, people being carried to you because they're unconscious or um, being supported because they're kind of, you know, very, very kind of woozy, um, lost control of their legs. Um, yeah, I don't know, does that answer your question? I think, I think yeah, one yeah. thing to, one thing maybe if I could chip in at, uh, about, about uh, accidents with with ketamine are also an issue i know that in our longitudinal study we we lost three people two from drowning in the bath and another from hypo mm. um from getting extremely cold um on a cold night and they'd just fallen asleep outside you know and but, but it's partly because of the analgesic and the anesthetic effects of the drug that you know there's also you can read about people who've put their hands on an electric fire and just not felt the pain in the same mm. way so that's just something we should be aware of it happens it happens and can yeah. i just follow also oh, just before we get to you friends can i follow up and ask you a question of something of an urban myth or legend which i've heard a few times possibly even from medics the idea that sometimes the effects of ketamine can actually prevent injury when people fall over I'm remembering someone trying to lean on a tree, missing the tree, rolling down a hill, and the paramedic who turned up saying, well, you're lucky your body was so floppy, or else you might have broken a leg or been paralysed. Yeah. Is there anything to that, or is that pure urban legend? You, you get the same thing with alcohol, don't you? I mean, and alcohol and ketamine yeah. share this, a similar action in the brain of, of being an antagonist at the NMDA receptor, mm. part of the glutamate, the, which is the main excitatory um neurotransmitter in your brain yeah no it makes sense cool. but I, I, I would back up before i move sorry back to current and josh loads of really good questions and um discussion in the chat and q a i promise i will get to them so keep on going with all the chat and q a um, there's so much good chat here i haven't needed to get to them yet but sorry i'm not sure if josh or Carenza was about to chime in there i was just going to back up what val said that actually one of the main risks of doing too much cat is 
is injuring yourself get you know we get people in welfare all the time they got blood spurting down their leg and they're just falling over yeah yeah and you know it, it take bristol which is a city with lots of waterways yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah this is this is this is i think this yeah. i think it's spot on there josh and i think this is one of my concerns around um you know that i know it's good that we're focusing on ketamine um i've got a kind of fear that there's you know it's it's the government might become interested in it um given what's going on at the moment um and i think um that some of the some of the focus has been in relation to people having accidents i think there was a um quite a, a, a tragic case recently that was covered a lot in the media um around waterways again um so i i, it, I and i think i, I mean I, I think in relation to kind of license events you know clubbers at license events um there does seem to be a relative awareness about that uh in terms of you know keeping an eye on friends um uh, but also that accidents easily happen so i mean in in in, in some of the interviews people are talking about when they're afters like going down the the stairs on their bottom you know like bumping down the stairs instead of walking down the stairs which i quite like I don't know how people get up the stairs as well and like climbing up the stairs. And so I think there there is an awareness and quite a lot of people would also talk about like waking up with like a random bruise, like a big sub golf ball bruise. I remember that happened to me once as well. <laughs> I wonder what the hell is that? So I think that there is a kind of awareness um, uh, of the of the potential for accidents. And that that's something that is really concerning, I think. Um, thank you very much. In fact, you just reminded me of something else. Um, Josh, this will ring a bell for you of a particular nightclub in Brighton where there's a particular flight of stairs going from the main floor downstairs and the bouncers would always wait there, just basically giving a sobriety test to people who are trying to go down the stairs. And on their more liberal evenings, if someone wasn't very good at the stairs, they'd just be kind of sent out for like half an hour. And like, you can come in, you can come back in when you can do the stairs again, um, which I'd like to think was a harm reduction of them avoiding injury. But I think really it was, they just wanted to do a little bit wink, wink, nudge, nudge about the very blatant drug use in that particular nightclub and didn't want it to look look too, look too obvious. Um, I, I may have been timed out myself in that venue a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know you know where I mean then good good um so I think um we have got so many questions I might start some further um discussion on these I've got one here something else which I think is an interesting one a question from Patricia Casement who says what is heavy use and I think this is particularly interesting because there is such a huge sliding scale between occasional dabbing at nightclubs and some of the really chronic heavy use that Josh talked of, one, two, three, four, five, six grams of ketamine a day. So I wonder if all three panellists have got anything to say on where heavy use begins, or is it such a variable subjective area, such a benchmark isn't possible? We, in our research, we've defined heavy use as being use on on five or more days um a week and and that we had we did we did physical analyses so we looked at at hair and at urine um with these 90 ketamine users and we you know we verified that sort of thing with the, the, that corresponded with levels that we found in the biological samples and you know the the more frequent users were the ones with cystitis, K cramps, um, memory problems. So it sort of fitted in, but it was a bit, to be honest, I mean, it, it was a bit arbitrary how we defined it, but it kind of worked out okay for that that particular project and for our longitudinal research. But you know, it, it, we we could have got it wrong. It could have been every day. You know, it's going to be worse if it's every day. Yeah, I think that that fits with. Uh, perhaps the per perceptions of ketamine users as well that uh if it's if people start using ket rec you know in recreational settings linked to the music they're into or friendship group whatever then uh and this came out in tw you know 20 years ago in interviews as well that people said as soon as they were using it um uh outside of the weekend 
I mean, in the survey, most uh, of our respondents said that they used it uh, special occasions only, uh, particularly festivals, so that counted as a special occasion, or um, at weekends or um, at, at times where they didn't have school or work <laughs> uh, yeah. the next day. So although people are saying that ketamine is useful in terms of, you know, how, how short acting it is at the time and relatively low recovery time, they still understand, you know, problematic use as anything outside of those recreational settings like the spaces and times that they're out in so I think that's um I think that's that's one way maybe that people were saying oh well I, I, I know my friend needs help because he started using it the week uh, you know during the week mm -hmm. or... I think that um the the point of on a school night is is really key yeah. I think you know it's important not to um judge stigmatize the ways people in which use the ways in which people use drugs and some people do genuinely just enjoy using ketamine on their own and and you know that's how they want to do mm -hmm. it for them it's not a social activity um i mean for me it was always rec there was plenty loads of it about but for me it was always recreational until um i moved city and i met people who did it every day and i just thought fantastic this is a great idea you know <laughs> brilliant <laughs> um so that was kind of it for me but um you know, the metric I always use in my head, and I want to stress this is opinion. This is my opinion. This is not a metric that's been verified in any way whatsoever. For me, if someone is using more than two grams a week, I think that they are at risk at least. And if they're using three or more grams a week at that point, especially if it's, you know, three different days at that point for me, that's not that's probably a problem in their life. Different people have different lives and that's okay. But at that point, it's probably starting to be a problem, you know, just because they're going to be fatigued the next day. That's the kind of amount you, when you're using that much that you're going to start experiencing physical symptoms after prolonged periods of use. So, um, you know, these things are a bit, they, they are how long is a piece of string, uh, but that's kind of how I think of it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Another question, um, going slightly back to what was discussed, there was a very good question from Carla Hope. You've all mentioned several times it will pass in an hour. Should we not respond to 999 calls for ketamine overdoses? How can I judge if a person needs hospital? I don't know if Carla is a paramedic ambulance driver or works on 999. I'm most interested if 999 call handlers, I mean, it'd be great if, some, if, if a call handler is on this webinar, I would be surprised if the training for ketamine for 999 call handlers was all that great. Um, does anyone have anything on or what you know about what happens when someone calls 999 saying my friend's overdosing on ketamine? Do you know what happens? Any idea what should happen? I've just seen someone called Carla saying nurse triage on 999. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's who asked the question. Yeah. Uh, Kira's made a good point. You should respond to the symptoms you see as well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if someone's using he heavily, they they they're usually doubling up, trebling up on dosages. If the you know the heavy users we had in our research would would use until their supply ran out. So it's not like just it's one dose that's going to be you know you'll recover within the hour. If there's if someone is actually taking it um, within that hour, then the dosage will will, will accumulate, and then the, the ambulance people have to consider that. I, I think Kira is right as well. It, you know, if someone's unresponsive, it's worth taking it seriously, even if you're receiving if you know if you're receiving information that their friends tell you, yeah, they've taken ketamine, then you can you can take that into account. But at the end of the day, if someone's unresponsive. Is worth taking seriously. It might end up being a waste of your time, but if it wasn't, then and yeah. I think I think one of the other issues is around um, mixing with alcohol. Um, so when that presents, you know, as an acute, it, it looks awful. You know, you can see people really struggling and you know vomiting profusely and that kind of thing. I've not seen much of this. You don't you don't particularly get this really in. Uh, the kind of techno events that we've been doing observations at, I think Kira's experienced this more around um, festival welfare. Oh. Um, but yeah, so so that's something I was kind of wondering a little bit as well, um, you know, about 
in terms of mixing with alcohol, I'm guessing there's all the things around not letting people, you know, fall asleep in a certain position yeah. um, as well. So, so I think that's a kind of co- complica- complicating factor. In my experience in licensed event welfare, and Kira would also speak well on this, would be, you know, it's probably one of the most common reasons for admissions is someone who has gotten drunk they don't normally use ketamine their friend gave them some ketamine and now they're being carried into us um and they feel very very sick um yeah so you know it's i you know in the advice i give out to people it's generally if you're not a regular ketamine user and you've had a few to drink just stay away yeah don't go there and guys can i just tell you um, uh, one of the first questions we asked was about did you intend to use ketamine um this was about the first or the most recent time so we, we had 92 percent saying they intended to use it but but eight percent saying it was unintentional um so that was either because they didn't consent full stop or they thought it was something else um and cocaine is is the kind of obvious one um so yeah again that you know the the especially someone using a substance for the first time not realizing it was ketamine thinking it was cocaine i can't actually imagine how awful that would that would be you know in set in in context but yeah well actually got a couple of follow-ups from that so i think one is we did have fiona misham in the uh, uh in the attendees earlier so great to see there fiona and of course fiona one runs the loop where when the home office actually allowed them to do it so you can take drug samples to the loop at a festival they'll test what it is and I believe most commonly when people find a bag of mystery white powder on the floor, they hope it's not ketamine, but it probably is ketamine. And some of the great work the loop do is people can find out it's ketamine before kind of uh, um, trying and uh, trying and hoping for the best. Um, another, so two related questions I'd like to ask based on the previous discussion. Um, one is someone asked, what is a K-hole? Um, so I'll give my very brief what it what I think it is, and then I'll ask get the three of you to correct me or add anything more. So it's clearly a threshold in threshold level at which ketamine intoxication leads to absolute confusion, hallucination, kind of paralysis. Um, it's almost you could debate whether it's a quantitative or qualitative change in the level of inebriation. Um, and I guess you know those have worked in welfare it is those who have surpassed that point who often need looking after i don't know if anyone would add on to my definition of what a k-hole is i think it's a state of profound dissociation it's key Mm -hmm. to me i think yeah i I was gonna i was gonna i was thinking val current val you're probably the one who's yeah, going to be mo- most well qualified <laughs> to answer this question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so yeah, we know what a K. Uh, well, we now have a good working definition for a K <laughs> on the extreme of dissociation, which we'll run with. So thank you for that question and answer. One, one thing now, I would add to that is that well, um, K holes are very profound when you first start using early in your cat career. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, and as you, if you're a regular user. Um, you essentially stop being able to K-hole. Um, yeah. You know, you, you can end, you can enter very sort of extreme states and it kind of almost looks like that more like catastrophizing almost the symptoms we were talking about earlier um, rather than actually the kind of um, state of semi-consciousness where you feel like there's waves underneath your body and all this stuff that kind of stops really happening when you, if you're a regular ketamine user, you stop being able to enter that state. That's yeah. That's because of tolerance, doesn't it? Because yeah. it develops really fast to these kind of uh, NMDA antagonist type drugs of, of all sorts. Yeah. Um. So thank you for that. I'll say something that cropped up in the chat during this conversation is Victoria Smith posted a link to Wedinos, and Wedinos are great. They are an organisation to whom anyone can post a sample of drugs, and they will return you a letter by saying what it is. Um, so as you know, the Loop provides an in-person service. Wedinos, I believe, based in Wales, is something that samples of mystery drugs or drugs which you don't know the exact strength or composition can be sent to. Um, I've got one other question. I think this is mainly for Val. I don't know if you want know the answer to this one. Um, I think it's quite an important one. So I've you read of occasional tragedies where normally it's very young people die 
after using ketamine, very often it's one of the first times they've used it, often not the first. Both of the case studies I recently read about involved ketamine and alcohol. I believe one was a young woman who very sadly died at Boontown Fair. Another was a young woman who was very early on at the beginning, I think actually at Newcastle University, maybe a couple of years ago. And I did all the, you know, I tried to read all the media articles and anything I could find in the background of these. And they all said ketamine and alcohol and then respiratory failure. And as someone, I'm not a doctor. And I, so I, I don't know if anyone can help me to understand how when many people use ketamine and alcohol together very often, how it ends in tragedy in these occasional cases and have these cases led to harm reduction, um, any harm reduction knowledge. I don't know if Val or anyone else here knows about these cases or what can be read into them. I, th I think one of the reasons that ketamine is so safe as an anaesthetic is you don't mm. get respiratory depression with it. Mm. So I, I don't really follow that line of, of argument. Um, the main thing is, is the anaesthetic and analgesic so that you might be in the bath after a party or whatever um, and you're you're not aware of of your environment um, and that you know the, the fact that you're not responding to si signs of pain or distress or anything like that is, means that you're not taking the appropriate action as you normally would do to get out of the bath you know mm. um, and so drowning has happened or hypothermia or, or other sites or other sorts of uh, horrendous accidents where people have actually died um, with this mm. drug. In general, when I'm kind of responding to someone who's taken too many drugs, if it's ketamine, that is the one that I am least concerned about in mm. terms of are they kind of at immediate pharmacological risk, right? Um, you know, I think... Uh, it's certainly possible for airways to become constricted just because of the position of someone's head or neck. And so it's just important to know yeah. how to put someone in the recovery position, how to angle their head um, and all these types of things. And so, you know, if alcohol is involved, there could be vomit and that could obviously contribute to an inability to breathe. But um, ketamine itself, I don't personally see as a drug that leads to lethal overdose got some stats in front of me in 2016 um there were 12 deaths with any mention of ketamine um only ketamine was mentioned in seven of those deaths and then alcohol was also mentioned in six of those you know it's impossible to know the details of that and i wouldn't want to speculate um as it were i think it's really important that we that we don't kind of speculate on the, on the deaths of individuals but um it, it's 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 not something that I see as a lethal drug in and of itself, hence why it's so popular as an anaesthetic. And why it's so safe when used medically. It's, it's yeah. extraordinarily safe. Yeah. And I should add as well, um, I was you know, basing what I said then on media reports, which then went on the coroner's reports and you know, at various times when trying to research um, um, research various drug issues, I do find that coroner's reports are often very low on detail and I just wonder if coroners know that much about context of drug use and whether some coroners are very keen, if there's mention of drug use, to presume that was causal, in more causal in the incident than it actually was. And like you, Val, the suggestion it led to respiratory failure seemed peculiar, considering what I thought I knew about its medical and, and, medical and surgical uses. Yeah. Um, Another question here, which I think should probably have a fairly easy answer. Um, Eva Devaney, hi. Eva says, I have a question around ketamine and drug driving. What is the current knowledge? Um, has anyone got anything on this? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I've seen it done. I've been in plenty of cars where the driver's on a lot of ketamine. Um it's incredibly dangerous. I would say top tip with that is um, it's very easy to think that you are much more in control of your motor functions than you really are when you're on care. It's really, I see it all the time. People think, no, it's kind of, they like think, no, 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 I'm fine. I can do this. I can do that. And actually they really can't. Um, and with driving in particular, in terms of like, you know, response times, it's absolutely key to saving yours and other people's lives. Um, it's not something that is currently 
detected in roadside swabs. So if a police officer were to suspect you were impaired, they would do an impairment test and then they would take you to the station to test your blood, at which point they would find out if you have ketamine in your system. Um, so, um, you know, it's something, it's a drug that I've known people do at events where they're having to drive home. Not that I condone this in any way, because they know that it's not detected in the swab test. Take that as you will. Um, but yeah, highly dangerous. I would say highly, highly dangerous. I mean, it shares an action with alcohol. So you, we all know alcohol is not a good idea when you're driving. You know, it's the same, same with any drug that acts mm. in that glutamate system. Yeah, noted. Thanks. Another question. Um, there, and this is one from Jemima Pope asking, said that I know that in the early 90s, drug users of my parents' generation would inject ketamine for a full psychedelic experience. Um, and I don't know if any of you know the writings of John Lilly, a psychonaut yeah. who spent a lot of time injecting ketamine in isolation tanks and visiting many far off places while doing so. Um, and yes, I remember when I was in Brighton, there was certainly a fringe of heavy ketamine users who were injecting. So uh, in more recent, I must say that my memory stretching back is not recent times, it's more like about uh, 2006, 2007. Recently, um, is there much evidence of ketamine injection in heavy end users? Um, we've not found uh, really anything about injecting in our um, sample, but then these are, you know, young people going out to mainly licensed dance events. So uh, I think we have one person that have talked about it. Um, ketamine injecting is much more common in Europe. So in the kind of illegal rave scene in France, right through to Eastern Europe, um, ketamine seen as much more of a less socially acceptable drug. It's kind of seen as more dirty. It's not really, it's kind of seen as a bit dirty here, actually, but seen as more dirty in Europe, I'd say, when I've been to sort of big illegal ra raves out there. Um, mm. And so, yeah, there, there's much more, more people inject it out there. It was, um, it was, talked a bit about in the EMC DDA reports mm. in terms of um, use in Europe and saying that its use has gone up, um, yeah. not much in, you know, injecting use as well, Josh, but um, but even, you know, much lower prevalence than we have here in the UK um, yeah. across most of Europe. So, you know, that's, again, the UK is an outlier in terms of, you know, uh, prevalence of drug use. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, good um image of wastewater analysis where bristol is just like way <laughs> bigger than anywhere else in europe and um, the only people i've met who inject cat in um the uk are much are older we're talking 40s in their 40s um, and they've been doing that for a long long time uh so it's not something that i see among catman users in their 20s and 30s you see it's busy in hospitals with hospital staff having access to to liquid ketamine. Yeah, I guess there is a point. We'll probably get into later talking about a bit of the market for it and the form, exact form in which ketamine arrives has changing. There's always been the mythical NHS or veterinary vials, and then the exact you know, crystalline or shardiness has changed over time, which can have implications for diluting for injection, I presume. Um, we've kind of like, talked talk more about harms than I might have intended, but there's more good questions on it. And another one, do people here, perhaps in your surveys, Carenza, your research val or your harm reduction experience, Josh, hear of people with nasal difficulties from chronic ketamines, of course, those of us like me who grew up in the 90s, we all saw a photo of D D uh, Daniela Westbrook with the middle of her nose missing and a warning about uh, chronic cocaine use and uh, not having the septum of your nose anymore. Is yeah. there evidence of such um, symptoms of heavy ketamine use? Uh, yes, uh, I know lots of people that have a hole in their septum, um, including myself. Um, it's much less acidic than cocaine. Um, cocaine, like damage to your nose comes on much, much quicker, sort of gram for gram, pound for pound, if you're sniffing cocaine versus sniffing ketamine. Think about people who take a lot of ketamine, they're often sniffing a lot, like much more than really cocaine users would. 
so there's a lot more stuff going up there if that makes sense um so take that as you will i know a few people whose noses have completely collapsed so the bridge is just gone and their nose is essentially flat to their face not many but a couple um, that takes a lot that takes a like many many years of really 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 chronic use um so yeah if you put enough stuff in your nose it will collapse it doesn't really matter what it is but it's definitely a lot uh less corrosive than cocaine um, one of the things that came out in the survey um, was people using nasal sp sprays, and I think someone mentioned this in the uh, chat as well. Um, so, I mean, I don't know in terms of what, whether that would help with that issue, um, but people dissolving and then using it for nasal sprays. Not not that many people. Most people seem to say they were just kind of judging it quite high, <clears throat> doing bumps on keys and back of hands and that kind of thing. But But there is some nasal spray. Use. And it's actually Kira uh, picked this up that we should ask about that, um, which is not something I'd come across. But more than that, the number one advice I give out to prevent nasal damage is to clean out your nose with saline before you go to bed. Ooh, noted. And actually, on that, so maybe. We're trying not to imagine that at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm sure we'll come back to some harms again later. Does anyone have harm or harm reduction info on the ketamine and benzo mix? Or any or friends, any prevalence on how common that is? Um, some uh, use amongst uh, people afters, um, as in benzo, benzos will be used have you know right at the end, um uh in terms of getting asleep asleep as well. I think uh, I think the um some work around student use uh, of benzos has kind of flagged that that's an issue i know the benzo research uh, project has got some uh findings about about um student use in particular um so yeah. and i want to stress this is opinion this is my opinion this is not a metric that's been verified in any way whatsoever for me if someone is using more than two grams a week I think that they are at risk at least. And if they're using three or more grams a week at that point, especially if it's, you know, three different days at that point for me, that's not, that's probably a problem in their life. Different people have different lives and that's okay. But at that point, it's probably starting to be a problem, you know, just because they're going to be fatigued the next day. That's the kind of amount you, when you're using that much that you're going to start experiencing physical symptoms after prolonged periods of use. So um, you know, these things are a bit, they, they are how long is a piece of string, uh, but that's kind of how I think of it. Awesome, thank you. Um, another actually, um, going slightly back to what was discussed, there was a 